Modern animism makes the oldest spiritual belief easy for today's seekers to understand, practice, and live. Stay tuned and grow with us. I'm asked two questions all the time. The first is, do I teach a class on animism? Or where can someone find such a thing? And the second is, can I recommend a book on animism? And typically, my answer to both is no. But today, I'm happy to say yes. We're going to kill two birds with one stone. I'm going to tell you about that in just a minute. But first, let's give gratitude where it's due. I acknowledge and thank the element of earth for providing us with stability, a firm foundation, food, our bodies, and all the beautiful things that bless our lives every day. I acknowledge and thank the air for the breeze that carries our whispers to and from the other world, for ideas, inspiration, and words to share those ideas. I thank and acknowledge the fire for destroying that whose time has come, purification, power, and responsibility to wield it well. I acknowledge and thank water for helping us to go deep into the shadow to see the things we avoid that heal us and transform us. I acknowledge and thank the human, plant, animal, and mineral ancestors who help us in many ways that are seen and unseen. Thank you for providing us with all that we need to live this life. And I thank our listeners from all over the world who tune in each week and share their time with me. If anything here inspires or moves you, please give back by bringing your inspiration to life. Don't just make it a mental thing where you think, hmm, that's an interesting idea. Embody it. And if you want to have a two-way conversation, you're welcome to join my free group. The link is in the show notes. Within the group is a free book club. Anyone can join. And that is where I found the book that I'm going to talk to you about today. I'm sure most of you have heard of it. It's called The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. Hemingway won the Pulitzer Prize for this book, so it's very well known. But when we were looking for the next book to read in the book club and someone mentioned The Old Man and the Sea, I was skeptical. I hadn't read any Hemingway for decades, but I didn't recall that he was particularly spiritual, and this is a spiritual book club. Still, he's an excellent writer, so I thought I'd stay open-minded and give it a shot. Wow. I had no idea, (laughs) y'all. So our main character is Santiago. Santiago appears to be a passive Catholic. He prays when he needs help. He promises to say Hail Marys and Our Fathers, but he either doesn't or he rushes through it. So he's not a religious person, but he is a spiritual person. I would even call him an animist because the guy has no shadow at all. He's so mindful and present. He has problems, but he's not complaining about them. He isn't at the top of his game, but he's not worried about it. He just takes every day as it comes. And in a way, it's just Wu Wei. It's honest, flowing energy. And it's so attractive. I say this a lot, and I've probably said it here, but the thing I find most attractive about people is that I love when people show up as they are, real, vulnerable, transparent. And Santiago is that from start to finish. He's a flawed person, and his life's not ideal, but he's as close to a perfect person as I could ever imagine, and I just love him. So let's talk about the book in case you're not familiar with it. The book opens with our main character, Santiago, and he's coming home from fishing. It's his 84th day with no fish. And he meets up with Manolin, who is a boy whom Santiago taught to fish when he was five. And Manolin used to fish with Santiago, but after 40 days with no fish, his father made him switch to another boat. So let's pause there. The first animus theme is easily missed. It's a common motif in fairy tales and teaching stories because it mimics life. That is that the main character of the story are an elderly person and a child. And they don't have to be any particular gender or age, but what we have here is the meeting of innocence with wisdom, and that's a magical combination. Both are close to the other world. So the child, because he's recently come from there, and the elder because he's on his way. You could say that he has one foot in that world already. So it's a yin and yang type of wholeness. If you think of humans... We stand between heaven and earth. We're the bridge between worlds. And when the young and the old come together, they represent that completeness. Cinderella and her fairy godmother are another example of this. She's an innocent who transforms with the help of her fairy godmother. In Christianity, they say faith like a child. And what that means to me 
is that in order to find our true greatness or enlightenment, if you want to call it that, we have to embody our childlike energy and go primal. Kids are raw. They squeal when they're delighted. They run everywhere because they're full of energy and can't wait to do even the simplest things. Laughter comes easily to them. They can sleep anywhere when they're tired because they're natural. It's us adults who civilize them and train the nature out of them. But until then, children are rather without ego and can take the smallest of ideas, a wish or a dream, and use it to transform. We'll see Santiago do just that as the story goes on. But back on the beach, we see how the other fishermen treat Santiago. Some of them laugh at him and make fun of him because he's poor, raggedy, has nothing, and has come home with nothing again. Others are sad for him, but make polite conversation to hide it. But people are basically counting him out and don't see him as a real person, all except Manolin. Manolin allows Santiago to have his dignity, even as he provides food for him. Manolin treats him with respect because he loves him. And I see this as a reflection of our modern mainstream society. People often judge others by what they have, how they look, and their last accomplishments. If you aren't young, beautiful, and successful or strutting around, you don't have value. And this is transactional. Is the animus world reciprocal? Yes. Do you have to contribute to be a part of the community? Yes. But your contribution isn't related to your value. Your value comes from who we are as people. And Manolin loves Santiago for who he is. It's a simple, beautiful thing that gives the story a lot of emotion. I don't think it would be the same story at all had Hemingway not included this relationship. And it's a normal, natural thing for children to be cared for by the elderly. Children are dependent. Adults are independent. And elders are interdependent. So elders are natural caretakers for the young, which allows their children to be producers and providers and leave the kids in safe, capable hands during the day. I know Santiago isn't Marilyn's grandfather, so I'm not talking about them just animus family structures in general. And most of us don't have that access anymore. Families are geographically spread apart. Sometimes families are emotionally distanced. Kids are in daycare, and sometimes grandparents are living it up in their golden years and don't want to be bothered. When I was growing up, I lived next door to a man who I thought was ancient. He had grown children who never came over, and he was still working, so he was probably in his 50s. Every day after work, he'd go into his garden, and I followed him. If he was picking peas, I was picking peas. If he was weeding, I was weeding. In the summers, he'd go to the Great Lakes and bring back coolers full of fish. It took days to clean them all. I'd scale, and he'd cut off their heads and clean them. I could really relate to the old man and the boy dynamic because I had lived that. My next-door neighbor was my pal. He treated me like a person, not some pesky kid. And Santiago and Manolin had that, too. It's a meaningful way of relating to the world. When a tree is sacred, a flower, a worm, or a gecko, it changes the way that you move in the world and how you think. It just makes you connected. So back to our story. Santiago heads out to sea early the next morning with only a cup of coffee and him sort of sustenance, and he plans to go out further than the rest of the guys to where he thinks the big fish are. All throughout the book are sensuous descriptions of sea life that show Santiago's connection to the natural world. He calls the sea la mar, which demonstrates an understanding that the sea is female. She can be benevolent or loving. She could be mercurial and cruel because she's a female, <laughs> and that's her nature. He loves her for that. He accepts that that's, you know, that that's just what it is. And Santiago knows that younger fishermen often have called the sea El Mer, and that shows a combative relationship with the sea. It's like the sea is meant to be exploited and dominated. He sees this. He doesn't confront it or try to change it. He just notices it. And I think it's a very animist perspective as well. Everything is natural. Neither the yin nor yang are correct, but both are necessary. And we can't have one without the other. But one flows with nature and the other is in opposition typically. So it's not black and white. Things are always changing, but we always have to choose where we want to stand. Santiago catches every detail of the day. He smells the sea air. 
He notices the phosphorescence phosphorescence <laughs> of the gulf weed in the water when he rode beyond the drop of the ocean floor where the currents begin to swirl. He notices the hissing sound of the flying fish wings as they pass. He knew the nature and names of each bird and felt sorry for the weaker ones than the light ones that had a hard life. He knew how to work with the current to make rowing easier. He knew how to read the clouds and predict the weather. So he takes it all in, lingering, never in a hurry. And I get the feeling that he's seen all this day after day. None of it's new, but it is intimate. And it's like their private world and he delights in it. He finds comfort in it. He knows the nature of the animals and who will do what when. He knows that plankton means fish. He knows that which cloud shape means fine weather. His mind is occupied with his memories of turtles, birds, lions, and jellyfish. All his memories are full of color, life, and feeling. This isn't a guy who is part of the rat race at all. He's not worried about his 401k, how buff his abs are, or the hottie at the bar that he can pick up later. He's not worried about getting a promotion or a new car or making his next TikTok. He's a nature man. He's present in every moment. And for the most of the moments in the book, he's in a boat. That's where his mind, body, and soul are on the boat with the sea around him looking for fish. He doesn't care what people think. He's beyond that. He is who he is and doesn't need their approval. He doesn't need their fancy boats, their radios, or conveniences. He was doing what he was born to do, fish. That was his life. And on the 85th day, while far from shore, he hooked one. And for the next two days, he battles with the fish and battles with himself. As the fish pulls, he holds the line with his hands. He braces it with his back, and in the process, his muscles are held taut. The rope cuts his hands and into his back. It's torture. He knows he has a big marlin on the line. He also knows that he could end his misery at any time by cutting a line and going home, but he can't do that. He says, fish, I'll stay with you until I am dead. And then later he says, fish, I love you and respect you very much, but I will kill you dead before this day ends. This drags on for two days. The marlin is pulling him out to sea. Santiago is getting weaker and weaker. Remember, he's not eaten. He's only had one bottle of water, and being on the water is dehydrating, and it's exhausting. He's not really rested because he didn't want to lose the fish. So he chokes down some raw fish that he caught because he knows he needs his strength, but he's still weakening. His eyes are starting to play tricks on him. He's on the verge of passing out when he finally gets his chance, and he harpoons the marlin. It's the biggest marlin he's ever seen. It's so big that it won't fit in the boat, so he lashes it to the side. The problem is it's bleeding and it attracts a shark. And that's just like life too. Just when you land the biggest gig of your life, out come the sharks. They're out to steal a free meal that they didn't contribute to. And now you've got your guard up just to keep what's yours. Well, that's what's happening with Santiago. A shark takes a bite out of his marlin and Santiago feels that he's been bitten. His respect for the marlin as a worthy opponent bonds them. He later says to himself, you did not kill the fish only to keep alive and sell for food. You killed him for pride because you're a fisherman. You loved him when he was alive and you loved him after. If you loved him, is it not a sin to kill him or is it more? He feels that the marlin was an incredible foe. He has tons of respect for him and doesn't feel that people who eat him after he sells the marlin are worthy of him. And now comes a shark? Oh, no. <laughs> Santiago kills the shark with his harpoon and loses the harpoon in the process. He's still a long way from shore, and there are more shark attacks. As the sharks take more of the marlin, he wishes that he'd never caught the marlin. By the time he gets back to the shore, all that's left of the marlin is the skeleton and the head. It's the middle of the night. There's no one around. The old man brings his, old, his boat in and stumbles back to his shack and collapses on the bed. The next morning, Manolin finds him in bed and erupts in tears. The fishermen had gone out searching for Santiago but didn't find him. They presumed he was dead. Seeing the 18-foot skeleton tied to Santiago's boat. Now all the fishermen know what an amazing fisherman Santiago really is. 
He's earned his place in the community. But Santiago says that he was beaten, not by the fish, but afterwards. Manolin's not having any of it. Santiago is a hero in his eyes and doesn't want to fish with anyone else after this. So we have a hero's journey story, which I think is so cool because the hero of the story is an old man. And it just goes to show that you're never too old to have new adventures. Over and over again, we're called to prove ourselves and to go around the wheel of life again and reinvent ourselves. And Santiago's call to adventure was his 84th day streak of no fish. He said, I will boldly go where no man has gone before and struck out for the deep sea where sane fishermen avoid. And that's how he got his big prize. That's one of the stories of the wheel of life. You don't find yourself by playing the safe game. You have to suffer for it like Santiago did. So there's no getting around it. Life's not easy. Nature is not a kind mistress. She pushes and punishes with wind, rain, snow, and hail. I always open this show with thanks for all the good things that nature provides, but nature is a bitch too. And that's part of life. If you want to survive it, you have to grow a set and stand your ground. Santiago does that. He said, anyone can be a fisherman in May, which means that it, when it's easy and plentiful, life's easy. In September, when the weather is rougher and less predictable, the big boys come out. That's a challenge. And Santiago said, game on. My dad was a fisherman and we go to the ocean in September because he had high hopes of getting a big one. And I've never seen a fish fight or caught one, a big fish. Um, but the men would talk all night about their fish fights and it was a guy thing, apparently. <laughs> anyway, this is a story about the battle between brains and brawn too. Nature gives us both in different amounts. So which one's more important? In this story, uh, Santiago talks about an arm wrestling match when he was younger to show that he used to be Diesel. But of course, now that he's older, he's lost some of that. And the writing shows Santiago's thought process into what he's doing to hold on to the marlin. And it shows that he's making calculated decisions based on his years of fishing experience. As he watched the birds and the turtles, he also knew the nature of fish. So both brains and brawn were definitely in play. And it's a mental game. Santiago says about the fish, let him think that I'm more man than I am, and it will be so. Santiago knows that the marlin could break the line. It's a mental game with the marlin as well. Santiago thinks, I must never let him learn his strength, nor what he could do if he made his run. And that line haunts me because I think it's what every human needs to remember to move through the hard times and be all that they can be. We're not just our bodies, mind, emotion, or spirit. We're all of it. And when we rely too much on one aspect or don't believe in ourselves and don't go for it, we can be lost. I'm not sure if I've done a video or a podcast on humility in animism, but I think so. It's a gigantic animist value because it's hard to be connected and live in a tribal society without it. You won't fit in. And I think it's very easy to see that Santiago is humble. He's poor raggedy, talks to himself, and doesn't care what anyone thinks. When Manolin says that the old man is the best fisherman, Santiago knows that others are better. When Manolin brought food and was that was donated by the tavern owner, he accepted and said, thank you. So he's not a bum who doesn't have any pride. He has pride and humility. And I think that's a great combination. There's also a theme of isolation, which is a reflection of life. I say animism is about community and we're all one, but the flip side of that is that we're alone and lonely sometimes. The old man lives alone. Since Manolin was forbidden from going out with him, he's on the sea alone. And he says at least three times, I wish the boy were with me. But if we are to accomplish anything and exert our will, whatever we do has to be alone. I know we say teamwork makes the dream work and that nobody does anything alone, but it's not exactly true. The hero's adventure is something we do alone. The things that define your life and you are things that you do alone. If you choose to have a baby, only you can do that. If you want to lose weight, only you can do that. If you have to heal from something, only you can do that. And that aloneness is part of being you. There's no one like you. You're going to have to be a little weird to be truly you. And Santiago accepts that. 
And at the same time, the universe is always with you. Hemingway says this in the book in his line, no man was ever alone on the sea. Your ancestors are always with you. Even if there isn't another human soul with you, you are not alone. Every person who ever existed to make you possible is with you. Even when it feels that you're the only person in the world. So within this story is also the idea that death pays for life. Santiago eats the cold, uncooked fish to survive his ordeal. He doesn't enjoy it. He barely eats at all, but something has to die to sustain him. He also knew that killing the marlin would allow him to survive. Santiago said, first you borrow, then you beg. And he didn't want to be in that position, so he would kill. But not in a cold way that's just for money or survival. He shows us throughout the book that he respects the sea life. His role is to be the fisherman. It is what it is. Owls hunt mice. Mice are opportunistic feeders that eat what they can, including grains and fruit. So everything eats something to live. It's natural. You don't have to feel guilty about it, but it's good to recognize the circle of life, to sacrifice and give gratitude. Now, let me circle back to what I said in the beginning about transformation. Santiago is transformed by the experience. He went out a broken old man and came back a champion. Manolin wasn't there, but I'd say he was transformed too. When he saw Santiago was still alive and saw what he battled for three days that he was gone, he went from being a boy to a man. He stood up to his parents and said, I'm riding with the champion. Coming home with the elixir doesn't just benefit us. It benefits the community as well. I think one of the most beautiful elements of the story is that it shows life and its brutality. Santiago killing the marlin was brutal. The sharks stealing his prize is brutal. Santiago's poverty and loneliness is brutal, but it's also beautiful. It's a combination of both that makes life precious and meaningful. Santiago knows this and is accepting of it. I think this is why he says that a man can be destroyed but not defeated. Santiago went out with nothing. He put in the fight for his life and came back with nothing. But in the process, he regained his status as the champion in the community. He regained Manolin's companionship to help in his boat. And he went from being an old man to something different, maybe an elder. He's still old, but he has a different status now. And I think that's an important animist element as well. We don't do well with getting old in our culture. We don't have a respectable place for older people. And this story does. So I found The Old Man in the Sea a powerful story. It may not have been written as a spiritual story or an animist story, but I think it is. I think that a book that speaks true is animism. Animism is about living a natural life, and truth can't be separated from nature. I think this is the best way to learn about animism. Watch the animals. Have a relationship with them. Cultivate self-awareness. Santiago didn't have a moment of self-pity about his finances, his age, or his loneliness. He was mindful and accepting of everything. Nature is what it is. It doesn't apologize for the weather, natural disasters, or for predators killing prey. It is what it is, and it's brutal. So animism isn't about the stories, the rituals, or the ancestors. It's a way of living in alignment with nature that flows from your heart and your beliefs. You can't package it and sell it in a spiritual store because it's not there. It's not in a style of clothing or jewelry. It's not a hairstyle or a dance move or a rhythm because it looks unique in all of us. When you see someone with the confidence to take up space unapologetically while also making space for others to do the same and living without blame or complaining because they know that whatever is happening is all in the natural cycle of life, that's a nature-based spirituality. That's animism. It's about knowing that sometimes you're the windshield and sometimes you're the bug, and it's all good. That's the nature of life. It will end someday. But until then, you keep living, loving, and singing your unique, unique song. Santiago says he's strange, but that's only because he lives in a world where everyone is so distracted from their feelings, their lives, and themselves that they don't live in Santiago's perpetual now. Not once in the book does he ever time travel to the past or the future. When he thinks about lions on the beach, it's about how he loves that scene now. 
It's about how that scene makes him feel now. My mom's like this. I know a few Native American people who are like this. These are my favorite people because they're so present and solid. It's easy and inspiring to be in their company. So even though Santiago is a character, I'm so in love with him. He's been added to my list of people that serve as my mentors. So have you read The Old Man in the Sea? Tell me what you think of it in the comments. And if you'd like to join the book club, you can find the link in the show notes. Thanks for tuning in. See you next week. Music